Now, obviously, as uh, we were talking about when we were bouncing stuff back and forth for the interview, just before we get to your to your wrestling career and stuff, these days you're involved in like a a life coaching type counseling type type of stuff. Could you just tell everyone exactly uh, what it is you do and how you transitioned into it from from wrestling? Absolutely. Uh, what what basically happened is after wrestling, I was hooked on painkillers and uh, I was, wasn't in a happy place. In between a lot of the Japanese tours as well, I was bouncing uh, in bars, so pitching people out. And, uh, it, it was pretty aggressive, and, and the Japanese style, which I was most used to, is pretty aggressive wrestling too. Yeah. So I tended to carry that over in my private life, and, and when I got out, I found that that aggression didn't help me at all in real life, in normal life. And it was, it was a big adjustment because when you're on TV and people are treating you like a star and asking for autographs and pictures all the time, it's back to nothing. And you just get a normal job and people don't care who you are anymore. Uh, it's pretty tough. And, and then the ego, too, gets in the way. And uh, it's sort of a don't you know who I am kind of a thing after all those fans. <laughs> and it really hurt me. It, it hurt my relationships. It hurt my jobs. It hurt my own psyche. I was frustrated and pissed off all the time and I've, you know, I've been spoiled with lots of money buying basically what I wanted and kind of the, the girlfriends and the vehicles and the clothes and all that kind of eating out and that lifestyle uh, reduced down to nothing suddenly. I cracked my C5 and C6 vertebrae as well so that was part of the reason for more use of painkillers but they're highly addictive so um, I managed to, to lean off of them. It took quite a while and it was very difficult. And then I started to read on different philosophies and kind of study a little bit of everything in Christianity and Judaism and, and Hinduism and many others. And I settled upon uh, Buddhism. Even though I still believe in a God, I just like the principles of Buddhism. So uh, a couple of years after that, I, I met a Buddhist monk. Actually, somebody dragged me to a place that I actually didn't really want to go to. <laughs> And uh, the guy was amazing, you know, he just, his philosophies were great, he compared everything to normal life, like haagen ice cream and Pizza Hut and, and things like that, and email and capitals and email and how we treat ourselves and how we treat other people. So I did that, and in the meantime, uh, I got out of wrestling, obviously, and could, realized I couldn't do it anymore. For about a year afterwards, I kind of dreamed about getting back into it, but by the end of that year, I sort of thought, no, nah, you, you've had it. You're burnt out all the time. Your neck's screwed. I don't know if it'll ever work again. And, and I began to accept that. And I think that was the biggest thing was the acceptance of not being able to do something anymore. And that's, that's probably the hardest thing on people. And uh, as you know, quite a few of my friends and acquaintances have overdosed or committed suicide. Yeah. And I, I really think it's that awareness and that acceptance that helped me uh, not get to that full state. I mean, I went to bed every night wishing I wouldn't wake up in the morning, and that's close enough for me. Um, so I learned how to meditate and find a piece, uh, space of peace and calm, which it's just a practice thing. It's sort of like getting better at running and learning your second wind and maybe eventually going to a marathon. It's not a sit down, bing, there you go, walk out, and you're all enlightened or anything like that. It's a regular practice and I do like to compare it to physical fitness because they're so close in the way that you have to manage them and, and run the lifestyle with that. So instead of being angry and pissed off and frustrated and, and like a pressure cooker inside all the time, I managed to find a way of letting things go and relaxing and finding some peace and calm within myself. And it just totally changed my life. Uh, in the meantime, I, I didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, I wrestled until I was almost 30 and didn't really know how to do anything else at all, so I, I uh, did a couple odd jobs I really couldn't stand. I mean, uh, it's funny, I never knew what it was like to hate a job before, but I quickly <laughs> learned. <laughs> and I think a lot of people can relate to that. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, you know, it'd be cool, it'd be cool if I could go and personal train people, because I train with bodybuilders and powerlifters, and so I went to a few different places and finally got a job at this place called World Health Club, and it turned out that I wasn't training people who wanted to be athletes. I wasn't training people who wanted to be super fit. I wasn't training people who wanted to be body bodybuilders or powerlifters. It was all um, usually 40-something uh, women 
whose husbands bought their membership and they really didn't want to be there. <laughs> I did that eight hours a day for a while, and after a while, again, it was, well, I, I can't say literally, but, you know, in my mind, wanting to hang myself over it. <laughs> uh, more, more in a joking sense there, but I went up to the manager and I begged him, please, please, can you put me in the sales? I've never sold anything in my life, but I'll learn and I'll listen. He goes, yeah, and we'll do it next month. I said, next month, man, no, Bruce, I'm going to kill myself. You know, this is depressing with these women. They don't want to, I don't like it. It hurts. I don't want to. It's just over and over all day long. And I was thinking, well, how in the hell do you expect to get in shape then? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, yeah, we'll put you with uh, these other couple of people, a guy and a girl, and you listen to them and do everything they do and, and practice the process. And so I did. And he says, besides, man, you sold in the ring for 10 years. You sold people on your character, on your moves, on the reality of it. By suspending their disbelief, you can do this. So, sure enough, I did. I got better at that. And um, so, in the meanwhile, I was studying Buddhist principles again, still believing in God. So, uh, I just like the training of the mind. They call it Lo Jong, that's what they call it. And uh, really kept training my mind so that I, I'd get away from those angry states or the hanging on states. You know, they talk a lot about detachment or non attachment things not getting angry and it's not just about repressing anger it's about actually seeing it and seeing it when it first bubbles up and following it through and knowing how, how my true nature is and you know, not wanting to be that way but in the meantime I learned how to do sales I learned their system and I ended up managing three different health clubs there I got the big kahuna award they call it which is the highest percentage over quota for all their 13 clubs in Alberta which is quite an honor, yeah. and uh, I sat there for a while going, well, do I really want to sit here and get gray and be in a health club, be in a gym for the rest of my life, or until they fire me? <laughs> 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 and I thought, well, there's a limited future here, so I, and I always had a little bit of a dream about being a realtor, even when I was in the road for FMW. I thought, you know, I, I wish I could get the books and study for myself to create some kind of a future, because this can't last forever. And I never did do that, but uh, at 36, I went and studied from a real estate course, a provincial exam here. It was very, very tough. It was like going back to college again, except half my life later. And uh, I passed the exam and ended up getting in the Calgary Sun newspaper here for one of the top 100% club. And I worked for Remax Real Estate Central. It was the number one office in the world for 11 years in a row. So that was quite an honor. And uh, so what that led to was doing some coaching on letting go and some coaching on anger and I've also got a workshop coming up on April 24th. I have a bunch of people booked in for that on just the different processes that can help us clearly see where anger comes from and why it happens and, and what we can do about it and how we can spot it and see it early and manage it and go through it. And it's quite a beautiful way to live. But the other things, and most of my coaching now is a lot over the phone uh, a lot via email, and I'm coaching people on, on new to business, so on the sales process, the structure of that, how to go through it for somebody who's never sold anything before in their life or not very good at it, and uh, also on, on doing your mission statement and vision statement and core values for their company if they're an entrepreneur and setting up things so that they can create massive value and also picking a lane. Because a lot of people, when they get into business, they go, well, I'm good at this, I'm good at this, I'm good at this. So I'm going to mix all three. You can't do it that way because it confuses people. But yeah. People are, yeah, yeah. And people are dead set on that when they're breaking in as an entrepreneur most of the time. <laughs> so I have to try and grind them down and go, okay, pick a lane here. What's most important and what are you most passionate about and what do you think is going to sell? So uh, that's what I, most of my coaching is about. And... Uh, I can be reached at rickteitmanlive.com, and uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook as well, so easy to get a hold of me there um, if anybody's interested in that. Also, I do keynote speeches for oil and gas companies, so the speech that I do is really based on what it took to become a champion in wrestling. I was a champion here in Canada, uh, as you know, a brass knucks champion, yeah. world champion in FMW, and so I talk about the, the nuances, the little things, you know, training to be like a bodybuilder and be one of the biggest, most muscular guys there and also training with a power lifter and, and what it took and the psychology it took to lift heavier weights than almost anybody around. Uh, and, and being that in the SNW promotion and the promotions I went to, 
So even things like, you know, costume and trunks and face paint and hair color, just to make yourself stand out, it was all business to me. I went about it very methodically. I don't know if many people understand that, but it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't an accident. Everything I did was a, a minor detail, right down to the paint on my boots, that was methodical and thought out beforehand because I knew the reaction it would get. And part of that reaction it got was me getting more money than some of the other guys. <laughs> I mean, what what inspired you then, at, in, in your, say, in your teens, to get uh, involved to start training for, for the wrestling industry? Was it a... Was it something that you enjoyed? Was it a passion that, you, that were you a fan, or did you just kind of fall into it, or what happened? Yeah, you know, it seems like everything. I look back on my life, and I think everything was pretty pre-planned. I knew I, I watched a match, and I just started watching Stampede Wrestling and, uh, and WWE and WCW. I think it was NWA at the time. In my teens, and at sixteen, I watched the match between Ric Flair and Ronnie Garvin. And I was already at my brown belt in uh, martial arts that mixed karate and judo. So we're doing point sparring and just stopping at the tip of somebody's nose sometimes. <laughs> and so I'm watching these guys go at it, and I thought, you know, I can see through that. I can see what it's really about, and I can do that. And I was already six foot five at 16. So uh, I could slam dunk a basketball already. I was pretty athletic, and I just watched it at 16, and then I was determined to do it. I thought, well, screw this sitting in a desk all day long. It drives me crazy. I'm not learning that much. Although I did do, you know, finish high school and then uh, did one semester of college, but then ran off to join the circus. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. That match to me was one of the most amazing matches I'd ever seen. You know, the selling and the showmanship and and even the blood and the cage match and, you know, the violence of it, but the, the storyline of it and the character of each guy and how they took the audience through an emotional roller coaster ride, crowd psychology, all that stuff really appealed to me. And uh, I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. So at 18, I came out. Well, first of all, I, I asked everybody I knew in the Vancouver area, so that's the west coast of Canada, uh, if they knew anybody that wrestled and if I could get taught by anybody. And I didn't really have any money. So um, I was just a kid. And so uh, I ended up finding somebody who was my old schoolmate's sister's friend and her husband <laughs> that wrestled a little bit. And he was willing to take me and teach me a few things. So we went into this boxing ring, this stiff boxing ring that was probably 20 by 20. And uh, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I just got into martial arts. I could fight or, or take bumps anywhere. So he kind of taught me how to take bumps. Mine were crooked because they're judo style. So wrestling, you had to flip straight over and fall straight back. I had to readjust to that. That was kind of challenging at first. But uh, I think I did it. And, you know, Being 16, your mind is so flexible. I think I did it within about 10 minutes, sort of. Uh, and to me, that was a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, well, why don't you, you know, try going to, after teaching me a lockup and a headlock and an arm bar and headlock takeover and a bunch of other things, uh, he was a little surprised that I learned fairly quickly, but martial arts can be a lot more intricate than the wrestling moves. And I used a lot of the, those in Japan, too, which helped me get over. And again, I did it with a lot of thought, and I thought, well, okay, what's going to get me over with the fans? And in getting over with the fans, the promoter's going to pay me more money. Simple, right? <laughs> but a lot of guys didn't think about it that way. And uh, so he says, okay, go to the bottom rope, take a, take a bump off the bottom rope. So I climbed up there, flipped over, and landed on this pile of boards because it was a boxing ring. <laughs> and uh, it was a really stiff ring, but I, you know, I had pretty rubbery bones at that age, too. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, did it and didn't think anything of it, hopped right back up. He goes, uh, okay, well, uh, try the second rope. So I said, all right. Hopped up in the second rope, flipped over, landed on my back, got up, and he said, what next? And he looks at his friend, and I thought they were criticizing me. I thought they were thinking, well, this guy you know, sucks. And I was kind of like, oh, screw you guys in my head at the time. I remember <laughs> that. And he goes, uh, well, uh, why don't you try it from the top rope? And I just climbed up there, flipped over, landed on my back, got right back up, and said, okay, what next? He's looking at his friend over and over and over again. Their eyes are bulging out. And uh, I kind of figured it out. Okay, this is uh, highly unusual for these guys to see this first time somebody steps in a ring. And uh, so I, I guess I've had a natural talent as an athlete, too, the whole time. And then from there, uh, I watched Stampede Wrestling. And again, in my mind, kind of methodically thought that, you know, Bret Hart and Honky Tonk Man and the British Bulldogs and 
And uh, Flying Brian Pillman all went to the States at the time, so they went to WWE, and Pillman was in WCW. And I thought, okay, that's what I've got to do. i got to move to Calgary from Vancouver, which is about a 14-hour drive away. <laughs> a little over an hour and 10-minute flight. Uh, of course, I went on the, the bus that time. Uh, I was 18. I, I finished my, well, I didn't finish my semester of college. I came out to Calgary here, uh, learned how to wrestle a little bit, met the legendary Stu Hart down at the Stampede Pavilion, which is pretty cool, and he chatted with me for a bit, and I had only ever seen him on TV, so this is just, you know, awe-inspiring for me. It's, it's fantastic. And he stood and grabbed onto my wrist and my shoulder, and yeah, yeah, you're, a, you're a pretty big boy. Yeah. What are you, about 276 pounds? And I said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> He did this through the whole time I knew him for about 10 years, too. He got 286 and a half pounds. And, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every time, man. It was like a circus con. It was, it was hilarious. And so I went there and watched the guys on Stampede every Friday night. They had matches, and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. I could feel the energy of the audience. and I even knew more so that's what I wanted to do. So I started training for a bit, then I broke my ankle trying to do those. Well, they were actually flips off the top rope. And uh, here I was, a super heavyweight, trying to move up to a heavyweight. <laughs> Broke my ankle, uh, went back to Vancouver and finished my semester of college, and then stayed there for about 10 months, saved up some more money, and um, came back. And, and just as I came back, Stampede was starting to close its doors. So that was kind of a depressing thought. And I thought, oh, God, I came all the way out here for what? And um, it turned out that a lot of the guys, you know, uh, <laughs> Usually a lot of the jobbers who never got over started creating their own, their own, uh, promotion. <laughs> so they gathered some guys together and of course started putting themselves over. It was kind of funny, but it didn't, you know, it's all at work anyway, so. Um, and there were probably about five little promotions that were running through here in Saskatchewan and, uh, BC a little bit and Winnipeg, so, uh, I did a little bit of that with them and, Sometimes I was only wrestling once a month or once every two months, and I had to bounce around that to make uh, ends meet. And even then, uh, they'd offer us $25 or $50, and I don't even know if I saw $50 in the first two years, uh, a few beer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, sorry guys, we didn't make the gate, so we can't pay you. Sorry about that. A few of those. And uh, I just kept doing it. Instead of getting pissed off, and instead of, beating up a promoter for ripping me off, which a lot of guys did, uh, I just thought, you know, I got some practice, and I got in front of an audience, and I'm honing my craft, and I'll just consider it paying my dues, and I'm not going to get all wound up about it. So I kept a good reputation with the guys, and uh, I think just when I was kind of getting ready to pack it in and go, well, I've been doing this for two years now, and I'm not getting anywhere, um, I got fellow had sent my video to Japan, and so Ricky Fuji, who was wrestling in Stampede, and I'd met Ricky a bunch of times, too. Funniest thing I remember about him was he was standing in this bar that I was bouncing at, and ACDC, She Shook Me All Night Long, was on. <laughs> and he was singing it at the top of his lungs, but he got almost all the words wrong. <laughs> it was hilarious. And uh, he just thought he was pretty cool. But, you know, people around him liked him, too. He's a great guy. And so he was one of the contacts out there. And that's sort of how I got hooked up to go to Japan and FMW and started the more full-time work. Yeah, that, that's I was I was going to ask about that, but whenever you obviously in in your early days there, <coughs> excuse me, in your early days there, um, you you teamed with and you and you were still you were young when you were there, but you teamed with Mike Awesome. Obviously, now did you know him before you got over there, or was it a case of? just sort of two North Americans naturally gravitating to each other when you were there? Well, I don't, I don't, I think it was more the promotion's decision. Um, and we looked, you know, height-wise, yeah. weight-wise, uh, fairly similar. So, and that was another reason for me to add more color and, and to my hair and to my face paint and my trunks and my boots and everything else too to differentiate myself. But we met over there. We got along really well. Horace Boulder, Hulk Hogan's nephew, was over yep. there all the time, too, and I really got along with him well. And it, was, it was like a brotherhood. It was pretty cool, you know. I, I can honestly say probably that was the only time I could really think of 
in my wrestling career that there was great camaraderie and total honesty and, uh, and true friendship. You know, it's like Steve Austin had in the back of his leather vest that time, don't trust anybody in the PA. And unfortunately in that industry, it, it happens to be quite true. People are trying to stab you in the back all the time. You can't trust them. If, uh, if your girlfriend had a tendency to even consider straying, one of the guys would be right on her, you know that. Yeah. Uh, it was just dirty, man. The, the background and the core values of the people in that industry, for the most part. I'm not saying it was everybody, but it was pretty rotten, man. Uh, so, to be around these guys, I didn't realize how good I had it. And then they, uh, they started putting me over and they were putting Mike over and they were doing the same thing with Horace, but, uh, his name's Mike as well, Mike Balea. But uh, he didn't. He wasn't as serious about his workouts. I don't think at the time. I saw later pictures of him. He was freaking huge. <laughs> he came along, but during that time, he wasn't quite as big and he wasn't quite as athletic. He was a little bit more. I won't quite say clumsy, but maybe awkward. You know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so they put Mike and I together a lot after that, and we just gelled too as a tag team. Like I knew what he was thinking. He knew what I was thinking. Man, we just went at it, and there. our timing was great, and uh, we could kind of drag the other guys around and guide them a little bit. And then when it came to somebody like Onita, I mean, he was a master. He would be the one kind of leading us around by the nose. And, and we'd, we'd sit there and listen and learn and, and follow his lead and take on what he set out for us and, and just, you know, he kind of taught us probably without even knowing. I mean, you yourself, obviously, you were... You were tag champion with Mike for a short time, but you were also um, heavyweight champion there for for a few weeks as well as as a as a young guy and, and relatively short time in the industry. This must have been sort of a great boost for you. Yeah, I used to too. Um, it was cool and depressing at the same time, which seems to be kind of par for the course with the wrestling business anyway. <laughs> You know, there's so many jaded things that can happen, but there's so many exciting things that can happen. And it seems like it's really kind of uh, flatlined for a while and nothing's going on. And then all of a sudden some really great stuff happens and some kind of shitty stuff happens. And um, I, I ended up getting the, the belt. Uh, and then quickly afterwards they put Tarzan Goto over on me and... I didn't really have a chance to run with it. Yeah. Although, you know, I was still pretty green, and I, I kind of had an understanding of that for a while, but it was still a little bit of a letdown. And then they put Mike and I in there as the tag team champions, and, um, you know, I think we earned it. I think that we were bigger and stronger and had probably more legitimate fighting and wrestling abilities than most of the guys. And uh, Mike was a tough guy. He was a legit tough guy. And I remember one time there was a couple of Korean guys, second-degree black belts in Taekwondo, much smaller than us, though. And uh, this would have been something to put on some kind of a TV show. <laughs> These guys came in, and they are stiff kicking us, and they are stiff punching us, and we were just trying to work with them, you know. Stay, you know, a little bit firm, but not stiff with them, and trying to work with them. Try, and they just kept cracking us and nailing us, like right in the ribs, right in the forehead, and and uh, probably even in the nose a little bit. Mike and I, at one point, just turned around and looked at each other. And same thought process, same moment. And then we looked away, and we just went wham, wham, like forearms, working style, but across their back and a forearm across the side of the neck and head, just lambasted these guys, picked them up by the neck and the balls pretty much, pressed them over, and walked to the opposite side of the ring and threw them out into the audience. And uh, with pretty much blatant disregard, too. <laughs> and uh, one guy who had been around there quite a few times, he kind of got it, I think, and he crawled back into the ring. And the other guy, the greener guy, which, you know, you, you should have this stuff explained to you before you go over there. Gregory Verichev was a Russian judo Olympic medalist, and he got it. He never hurt anybody. So uh, this guy didn't want it, didn't seem to want to get it. And so Mike goes, power ball out to me. And I'm like, <laughs> No, no, Mike, you're finishing, you're taking, you're, you know, you're going over. He's just furious, right? So I'm like, okay, he wants to punish this guy again. So I flip him up and do my spinning powerbomb with him and stuff him pretty hard. But, God, Mike picked him up and flipped him about eight feet in the air and just drove him down in his sit-down powerbomb and just crammed this guy into the mat. And, uh, and the other guy wouldn't even get back in the ring. <laughs> 
And uh, needless to say, we both flew home the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and I was surprised. I thought we were going to get at least a reprimand and probably fired, but nothing was said. I think they just got it. Like, you know, nobody can screw with you guys. You're a top guy. Just to hell with it. I mean, interesting. Oh, I mean, obviously, in your time off that before, we just talk about but you and your time in WBF, obviously Mike had been in, in ECW and WCW and, and so on, um, but, I mean, had you been in contact with him after you left, and, and do you think, um, given everything that obviously that, that happened to, sort of to him and with him, do you think if your type of what next uh, stuff had been around for him, that, that that really would have helped him? You know, I don't know if I was in a position to be able to help him. Um... If I maybe lived near him, I could have had some kind of influence. But yeah. I, I don't think I'd like to even consider playing God or anything like that. And um, I mean, it, it, when it comes to, and I don't know what he was up to, and, and uh, I, him and I had kept in touch a little bit. I was in the WWE. I was down in Florida. I actually stayed with him in Tampa, Florida. I met his wife and kid, and I think I'd met her actually before on tour a couple of times as well. Um, and they're terrific, and it was so nice to see them have a family life, because I never did have a family life while I in that business at all. And, uh, and I kind of envied that and appreciated it and respected it. And uh, I thought, if anything, that's going to save him from, from some of the attitude that a lot of the guys had. Yeah. You know, that I, I still had, too. I, I won't deny it. If people are close to me. I treated them really well. But if they weren't close to me, I probably didn't treat them very well at all. And uh, just that ego. And, and also defense, self-defense, and you get a lot, of, a lot of assholes and idiots coming up and saying things like, you know, is it fake, and you, you're the fake razor, and you suck, and you hear this stuff all day long after a while, yeah. you, you get pretty jaded, and you don't really care to be nice to anybody anymore, and it's too bad that a few uh, paint the whole scene with the same color for you, because then you're, you get kind of rude to everybody after a while, but uh, regardless, yeah, Mike and I didn't... Uh, it's a funny, fickle thing, and I noticed I did it with Victor Kruger, who was a friend of mine in Austria and Germany. Uh, he had been calling me for quite a while when I was in the WWE, and I was thinking I was a big shot, I guess. And, you know, what? why do I need to call back somebody from that that far past? And and I think there's some ego and attitude that goes in, especially in, in my 20s. You know, now into my 30s, now even into my 40s. I don't think that way at all anymore, but also I've gone through a lot of mental training so it was not to be that way. And I found that um, it, it was really hard to keep in touch with the guys that I'd spent a lot of time with and thought I'd gotten a good friendship with. Uh, and being on the road all the time, you know, guys just don't, their life is fast-paced. They get a phone call, they forget in an hour, and the next day they forget altogether. I understand that. Uh, but it's sort of a big boys crew too. If you're not part of that clique anymore, if you're not part of the industry anymore and you're not cool, then they just write you off. Yeah. You know, they don't bother with you at all. And I've tried to phone a bunch of people and keep in touch with a bunch of them and, uh, pretty much no response whatsoever. It's a little bit sad. I mean, when we, you mentioned there, the, that, that's called the, the New Year's room on, <laughs> when, that, when you came in to the WBF in, in 96. Um, now, what led to you um, to, to getting the gig there? I'm assuming there was interest in them or with them in you before the character came up, but what led to you joining? Uh, it was fun. I used to goof around and just do imitations of wrestlers all the time. I, I loved Hulk Hogan, so i pull out a, I was in FMW or WAR, let me tell you something, brother. <laughs> and I do that with a couple of guys, and traveling with Chris Jericho there, and then I do the, hey man, oil man, Chico, just playing around, and Chris used to sing, you're not Scott Hall, man, quit doing that, you're trying to be nuts. Because I just screw around with him sometimes, and, and uh, oh, it was really goofing off, and then uh, Sabu, actually, I, I hadn't been working for a little while. I was really frustrated. I was really down. So uh, I think just like any sport or entertainment industry, when people have a quick stop to it and they're, they're gone out of the scene for a few months or even a year, uh, it's pretty depressing. You know, you got all that excitement, all that adrenaline every night, all these people vying after you, and all of a sudden you got nothing. It's flatlined, and it's 
depressing. And it's hard to adjust. And so I was sitting around my place, still working out hard, but, you know, kind of down. And uh, Sabu called me out of the blue, and he goes, Hey, Titan, want to come to ECW? As soon as I pick up the phone, right? <laughs> uh, I didn't even know what to say. I, it took me a second to even register that I was getting a phone call from Sabu. I hadn't talked to him in so long. I said, Yeah, I'd love to, sure. And so he talks to me, uh, talks to me about it. You know, part of it was I, Paulie wanted to have Big Titan in to get beat by Sabu, the, the big big shot uh, FMW had former champion and tag team champion gets beat by his homicidal suicidal star right and so I, I knew that but that was cool we had an amazing match it's, it was pretty awesome uh, I smashed through a table him and I did all these reversals and crazy things I shot him up for a backdrop he drop kicked me right out of it and what an acrobat and uh, combined with my strength we did some pretty cool stuff yeah. and we, we knew each other too so I knew his moves, he knew my moves, uh, it was just, a, it was beautiful. But, uh, anyway, so I went to UCW a couple of times, and then, uh, uh, Paulie says, I, I bought Hack Myers the night before, and then, uh, we were supposed to fight the Dudley Brothers, uh, which was a very displeasurable match, as far as I'm concerned, but, uh, you know, not much give, a whole lot of take, and very, very stiff. They were quite over at the time, so in a sense, that's to be expected. In a sense, I lost a lot of respect for them. But um, So I'm in there in the, in the locker room, and Polly dangerously says to me, Yeah, yeah, Titan, here's what we want to do with a six-man tag. You know, crazy and frenetic. He's always like that. <laughs> it's not at work. <laughs> and I said, just out of a joke, I was in a certain mood, and I said, What the fuck do you want me to do, man? <laughs> he goes, Oh, my God. Oh my God! Can you do that out there? And I'm kind of, oh, geez, I don't know. Uh, well, Jericho was there, and uh, Chris Benoit was there, and um, he grabbed the walkie-talkie and took it over to Shane. He goes, "Here's what I want you to say to Shane," because the rumor, from what I understand, is that Shane was in there and WWE Dean Douglas and yeah. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash stabbed him in the back. Uh, I'm not sure to, to the total truth of that, but that was my understanding at the time. So he was pissed at Scott Hall, and, and he probably would have gone pissed to cuss with him <laughs> if he was there. And the fact that Paulie hired him and betrayed Shane, uh, that was a big deal. So he goes, just say this. And he takes the walkie-talkie over to Shane. Well, Shane had his own, I'm sorry. And he goes, yeah, Shane, I got somebody here who wants to talk to you. And Shane's like, yeah, what's up? <laughs> I said, hey, Douglas, you didn't think I was going to go down to Atlanta before I came here to kick your ass, did you, Chico? He stood up and he was like, oh, his eyes were bulging out of his, his head. He was deep red in the face. Veins were popping out of his neck. He was just enraged. And I stood up and I was sitting down trying to hide on him a little bit. And I reached up with the walkie-talkie and sort of waved it over at him and smiled from ear to ear. And he just went, oh, I just collapsed practically and ran over and said the same thing. Man, can you do that out there? So, um... Uh, and I don't know about the full truth of this or not, but apparently uh, WWE was in the town or near town at the same time. One of the uh, referees was a, a scout or an agent as well, and, and this is only what I've heard. Again, I never met him. I don't know if this is the full situation, but uh, I got asked to go do that out there. And I asked Sabu and I asked Ben why. I said, look, guys, do you think this is a good idea? I mean, either it's going to propel my career because of Steve Richards and Blue Meanie doing these, these uh, kind of imitations and parodies, it, it could really do something for me and people might want me back all the time and that would be cool because I always wanted to wrestle in the States. And uh, he said, I don't know, I don't know. So, you know, we all came to the conclusion that it's either going to propel me to start him in ECW or it's going to be the nail in the coffin for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll take the chance because, you know, Big Titan's been only getting over in a mediocre, lukewarm way over here so far. And, um, I'll take the chance. So I went out there and, and I had my hair slicked back and a strand pulled down. I had one gold necklace on, uh, a black leather vest I had from Germany, and uh, my cow print trunks and boots still. And uh, two thick in my mouth, one behind my ear. And I said, uh, the people were kind of looking at me as I came out. They played low rider. And I think they called me Slice and Dice from here as. I think people were expecting Scott Hall, but then I came out and I did that little glide walk and got into it. did my little shuffle and wiped off my boots on the ring apron and slowly stepped between the ropes and 
they gave me the mic first because they needed a setup. And I said, Dudley Brothers, I got no problem with you, man. And all of a sudden, the people started laughing, you know. And I said, but Hack Myers, I go and kick your fucking ass. <laughs> I took the, <laughs> took the toothpick out of my mouth, threw it right in his face. He looked stunned, and then the, the mosh started the, the cluster of a, of a match that we had after that. It was awful. But as soon as I said that, man, the people went through the roof. They went ballistic because that was the greatest thing they had ever seen as far as uh, my experience with them is anyway. And, uh, and it was a blast to do it. And so one of the agents apparently saw that. Bret Hart, I'd been talking with him for about a year, uh, went to Germany for six months as well. And uh, he finally said, well, you know, we, we can get you in there with Vince. And he was going back. He had taken a bit of time off. And so he asked for me, Kurgan the Giant, uh, I think Luke from Montreal, who was Rambo in Europe, very yeah. famous up there yeah. for years. Uh, just a, just a bunch of Canadian guys. Phil LaFon from All Japan Pro Wrestling, Doug Furness. And so a bunch of us Canadians got in, due to Brett, I believe. And, uh, and when I, so I, I did a tryout with, uh, uh, Frank Stiletto was his name. Nice guy came into the locker room and says, I said, well, what do you want to do tonight, Frank? He goes, no, man, you're a big titan from Japan. I'm just here to put you over. What do you want to do? <laughs> and I thought that was really nice of him, but I thought, you know, also I always like to give the guys I work with some spots at least. And uh, so I tried to call some stuff. I said, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? He goes, no, 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 I'm just here to put you over. What do you want to do? This went on for a bit. Finally, I just said, okay. So I told him what I wanted to do, and I basically went in there and just beat the shit out of him. I didn't hurt him, but uh, just walloped him, pressed him overhead, threw him around like a rag doll, stiffed him with a clothesline in the corner, uh, just did all the Japanese-style stuff and really, really laid it in and then swing and powerbombed him. And it was a pretty flat reaction from the audience because he just didn't know who I was. Yeah. You know? And uh, that's that happened. And then I was supposed to do another match with... Uh, I think it was Freddie Boy Floyd, and we had this awesome match called in the background, in the, sorry, in the locker room area. And I knew it was going to be good because I knew how he worked. I watched him for years, and he kind of physically moved a lot like Sabu. I knew it was going to be smooth, and the transitions, and the reversals, and the high spots, and everything in the psychology was going to be really good. He called some really great psychology into it. And uh, we're about to go out, all ready to go. And he goes, sorry, guys, you're not going to have a match. Vader went too long. <laughs> I was so let down because that was my dream since I was 16. At this point, I was 26. So 10 years later, and I get this, and I'm like, oh, God, I can't believe this. You know, I was just down, and so I ended up going home and sitting around for two weeks, again, kind of depressed. And uh, then Vince McMahon calls me on my answering service, and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Rick, this is Vince McMahon. Can you please call me at my home number at your earliest convenience? Well, I just, I thought that was super exciting. I was jumping up and down practically, and uh, and I was totally elated by it. But, you know, I thought about it later on. Okay, why did he call me at home himself instead of one of the agents? Uh, why did he give me his home number? Uh, something's up here. <laughs> so he ends up saying to me, uh, yeah, Rick, uh, the people want Razor Ramon back, and I heard you do a great Razor Ramon. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Because <laughs> I knew what was going to happen, you know, I, I knew right there and then, and it, and it did happen. And uh, only an idiot could not figure that one out. But for me, it was you know maybe this is the only chance I'll ever get to be in the WWF and work my dream. Yeah, that's where that was where it lied. And I thought if I say no to Vince right now, I know Vince well enough from his reputation, from the guys that I know that he'd probably be pissed at me, hold a vendetta against me and some resentment and never hire me again if I said no to his little plan, you know. And I knew that he was partly doing it to piss off Scott Hall and Kevin Nash to tell them I created you, you know, I'm God and you're yeah. nothing and all that kind of crap. And even though they went on to make the NWO and the biggest splash that wrestling's ever seen pretty much. But, uh, yeah, I knew what was going to happen. I just wanted my chance in the WWE, and, you know, I can say I've been there and done that. And I had a lot of fun there. And, uh, you know, the New Yorkers were really fickle. They were really rude. They uh, they didn't accept it at all, and all they ever told me was I suck, basically. <laughs> Even though I was, you know, 25 pounds heavier than Scott Hall, and I was working my ass off in the ring physically, 
and you couldn't do anything to please these guys. Just they're ignorant, and uh, it's a crowd that you just you'd rather not wrestle in front of. But the guys in, in San Francisco and San Diego, they're a heavy Latino population. So with the Razor Ramon character, they liked the character. And they thought it was super cool that Razor Ramon was back, whoever was playing the part. And so when I walked out there, I was a heel, but I'd just throw my hands open and chew on my toothpick and roll my head around and nod, and they'd all cheer. And that was pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a difference between heel heat and pissing the fans off and getting real heat or them just telling you, you suck, go home, we want the old guy. You know, that's not heat, that's just bad. Yeah, I mean, I mean you, you you were saying there that obviously um, that anybody, if they were looking at, could have seen what was going to happen sort of to it over, over that period of time. But once once it sort of became obvious to an extent that, that Vince had soured on it, might be the wrong way to put it, but once he decided to change things, Obviously, they gave um, and Glenn, who had come in with him, was doing the fake Diesel. He got um, a few chances after that, and obviously settled into the to the Kane role, and, and that was fine. Why do you think, or, or were you given any word as to to why you never really got the second chance, you, the second you don't fight tell out? You why they don't care? You know, I I have to say, maybe I'm assuming things here, but. It's a fickle industry, and it was fickle from day one, and I knew I couldn't trust a lot of people. You don't trust what they say to you. They will twist the truth. They'll tell you what you want to hear to keep you happy and then stab you in the back and screw you over. It's a, it's a disgusting yeah. industry, actually, sometimes, you know. And um, When they let you go, they don't care. If you, if you practically died and turned into a pile of dust right before their very eyes, they'd go, oh, well kick the dust aside and keep on walking and think about what's next for lunch. I mean, it's just, they didn't give a damn. They don't give a damn about anybody. Um, you know, that's maybe an exaggeration. I know that, that this was close to a few guys and Brett being one of them, and I don't know how how much of a shoot that whole thing was between him and Vince. But regardless, I, uh, I did go, you know, and from what I understand, so Brett punched out Vince, that whole schmuck thing, <laughs> I don't know if that was storyline, because Brett was one of the best storyline writers in the history of the business, as well as Vince. And, and it looked, to me, I saw a sandpapered eye on Vince on TV a few days later, and uh, I chatted with Jim the Anvil Neidhart, who was tugging on his beard, and I said to him, because uh, I'd known Jim well enough, I worked with him, and, and I lived around him in Calgary, spent time with him, uh, spent some time with him in Germany, and then spent some time around him in WWE when I was there. I said, Jim, was that was that a work or was that real? And he wouldn't beat me in the eyes. And he kept tugging on his beard. He was nervous about it. <laughs> no, 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 it was all real. Yeah, yep, oh, yeah, it was, it was totally real. I saw it in the back of the locker room. Yep, yep. And then he just kind of turned away and dashed off. And I thought, hmm, I don't know, man. But uh, regardless, of, you know, and it's all about making money, really, when it boils down to it in business. And Brett went off and did his thing and had a, a boost in popularity rather than a quiet exit trying to go to WCW like a mouse. He went out there with a bang, even though that didn't work out all that great for him either. And then all the Canadian guys that had the year contract uh, that were running up shortly after, every single one of us, uh, well, we didn't get fired, we didn't get renewed. Yeah. None of us. That, that's a little coincidental. So, you know, in that respect of things, it could have been real. Or he just thought, now we're getting rid of Brett, and I'm choking him for going for more money to Turner, and uh, screw the Canadian guys, too, whatever. So, um, that's, that's just kind of the, the effect of it. I phoned Vince, I still had his home number, actually, from that first phone call. And then I, he says to me, uh, I, I call him up, and I'm hoping, I see Glenn Jacobs going back and yeah. doing some Unibomb stuff, and seeing that the, uh, I don't know if they turned him into Kane yet at that point, but I knew they were building him back into another character in there. The thing is, it's so political, wrestling, especially in the, uh, the big leagues. And uh, it's just ruled by politics. And he was in good with the Southern Glory guys and Dutch Mantel and probably Bradshaw, and who wasn't really in there at that time. But he, um, yeah, and he was a great worker and a big, huge guy, taller and bigger and stronger than me. Uh you know, but I, obviously I still had some talent, and I wouldn't have been as big over in Japan as I was without any talent. It's That's the hardest work rate there is on the planet. Yeah. So 
I called up Vince. <laughs> he wasn't expecting my call, and I said, hey, Vince, this is Rick Titan here from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I'm just wondering, my contract's running up here, and is there anything we can do? Can we change the character? Can we morph it? Can we um, do something creative? Can we create something new? Or even call me Razor something else? And he says, all he said to me was, Rick, please don't call me at this number again. And hangs up. <laughs> that was it, man. Cold. But at the time, the blood drained out of my face, and yeah. my heart almost stopped beating. <laughs> you know, I was a 26, 27-year-old guy, and, and uh, it's like my life was over, and I just got kicked right in the teeth. But now looking back, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened, and life is really good right now. I, You know, I look at the big picture of things and, and the guys that are no longer with us. Yeah. Uh, and I had my problems with some drinking and some painkillers as well, but I managed my way through them, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, so many guys that, you know, they say heart attack, and, and quite a few of them too, but well, in your late 30s, what's the most common cause of a heart attack, right? And I don't know. I'm not putting any labels on anybody or saying that anybody did anything any different than anybody else, but uh, coincidental, maybe, is the word I'll use. And it's really sad. And uh, to progress to the point where I am now after going through, you know, doing successful in the health club industry and managing three different clubs and then becoming a successful real estate agent, making really good money for a few years and, until the market crashed. That was a challenging time for everybody. Uh, and then now revamping things to do sales training and, and small business training and teaching people some meditation and reaching out a bit and helping the world, really. I mean, uh, I've got people from the States and from England that have bought my book, Wrestling with Consciousness, uh, former criminal lawyers, former uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, people that are trying to change their life, and they see that after an aggressive kind of a, I don't know, I don't know what you'd call a criminal lawyer, but I know he didn't feel good about himself, and I know he wasn't happy, and did a lot of things that he'd regret, and it was a, it was a dark inside world for him, and with some of the, you know, information that I shared from the experiences that I learned from others, I know I helped them out. And that's pretty cool. Obviously, um this was sort of sort of head towards Canada or whatever, you you obviously you had um you talked about obviously the neck problems that you had that I believe happened when you were out in Japan and obviously do they um does it still give you any bother now? And like, also linked to that, almost the other side of that. What advice, g given all the things that, that have happened to you inside and outside of the industry, then what advice would you give to anyone who was thinking of getting involved in it now? Who was thinking of getting into it now? Yeah. Um, go for your dream. Do it. I mean, I don't. I still don't regret it. That's one thing I can say through all the negative things I've said. <laughs> Still don't regret it. I'd do it all over again if I were a, a teenager or in my twenties because that's what that's what my dream was. And I think I you know, I had my parents ask me one time, "Do you think it was worth it?" And I said, "Well, if I were 80 years old in my last days, 90, rocking back and forth in a rocking chair on a deck somewhere, and if I said, what if, what if I had, yeah. it? what a way to go, man. Yeah. Go for your dreams. At the same time." A good family life and some good real friends back home are very important. Uh, not losing sight of what reality is and being involved in a lot of different things that people do in day-to-day -day activities in normal life, because wrestling is not a normal life. It's, it's the opposite of normal. <laughs> and uh, to try to have an exit plan, that would be the biggest thing. Study something, get connections to do a different job that you would enjoy, because I had nothing it was all over and done, and save some money. Uh, I didn't save any money. And so I think a, a bit of an education, at least a knowledge about some kind of a business or an industry that you enjoy afterwards, because it does not last forever. And uh, try and put some money away, they say 10%, I wish I had of, uh, and uh, get some good, wholesome people around you and, and a good support system real friends and real family that are close to you and they keep you in check as to what a good life and reality are and then go have fun. Yeah. I 
mean, you mentioned earlier on, obviously you have um, the stuff coming up on the 24th of April, just uh, again as we, as we just totally yeah, found it. Yeah, workshop. It's yeah. Really pretty cool. It's based on anger, and I think I went through a little bit of that earlier. It's yeah. just the top of mind, uh, conscious level, oh, I'm not going to be angry, or I'm going to repress it and stuff it down anymore. It's more of a going to the other than conscious portion of the mind with a little bit of breathing and relaxation involved. There's a theta state that it takes to get into for the mind to really accept and understand things. And that's kind of what this is about. And then to dissect everything piece by piece as to why we get angry, what triggers us, what we can do along the way. Uh, but I think more for, for your readers and listeners, I guess, um, the fact that I'm doing a lot of coaching by phone now, and uh, doing a lot of coaching, uh, even on email, in business. So somebody just breaking into business that doesn't know what to do, doesn't know how to start out, doesn't know how to go get those customers, doesn't know how to get the money rolling in, I can help with that. Uh, and obviously you talked about the email earlier on, so just how you can, through the email and through Facebook and stuff, people can keep up to date with what you're doing there? Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, even an email transfer is an easy way to, to do the financial part of it. I do three, six sessions, usually something like that with somebody. I'm on LinkedIn quite heavily so they can check out my background a little bit more on there. I'm on Facebook all the time. And, uh, Rick Titan at live.com is my exact email address. And, uh, if it's all a bunch of wrestling questions, I, I can hopefully get back to them slowly. <laughs> it's a business question and, and it's going to involve somebody getting some help and me doing my livelihood, I'll most likely get back to that one within 24 hours or less. Well, I'll say I really appreciate it because I just realized we've been going like 45, 50 minutes and it's been, it's been really good. I really appreciate you, as I said earlier on, giving me uh, your time today. It's been, it's been really, really good. It's been really interesting. Oh, thanks, Gary. I know I talked your ear off and I appreciate the time too and the, the promotion. 